Hello and welcome back again to another amazing episode. My name is Hayford. If you don't know who I am, I am a content creator, a cinematographer, and this is the diaspora transition episode. I am interviewing people who moved back from the diaspora and currently living on the continent and are doing great things. So in this, on this episode, I have here with me a very special gentleman with the name Tim Swain. So without further ado, Tim, welcome on the show. Mr. Tim, as a matter of fact. Yeah, oh, oh, you, you, you definitely can just say Tim. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for having me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've seen your work and, and I'm a fan of you telling stories that help people connect all over the globe. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so welcome on the show one more time. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself to the people watching? Yeah. If it's the first time um, watching it. Yeah, sure. So if it's the first time, mm -hmm. so my name is Tim Swain, content creator relocated to Ghana after about 15 years of coming in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been in Ghana three years and my goal is to really create uh, an environment where I can connect our culture through our stories. And I'm doing it via my YouTube and having great conversations like this. Okay, so you've been here for 15 years, back and forth. Back and forth, yeah. Wow, Yeah. that's a lot. But why Ghana though? Yeah, the answer I give is very unexciting. It's, mm. it's because this is the first country on the continent I got introduced to. By who? By a missionary organization okay. that works with uh, black Americans and Africans. I came for a seven week mission trip mm -hmm. in 2000 and I think seven. Okay. I actually still have the airline ticket. Your first flight to I Africa? Still, I, this, the first time I came to Ghana, I still have the original ticket. And that trip transformed my life. Wow. So, I mean, it, it just felt like Ghana had a place in my heart since then. And then I kept coming back and forth, started an organization that brings people to Ghana. And I realized I really have to be here if I really want to make a greater impact. Because every time I came to Ghana, I realized that I really don't know Ghana. Hmm. Why do you think that was necessary for you to create that organization to bring people to Africa? Because it was, it was so, I mean, I try to explain this to people who, mm. who've been in an environment where they've never been the other or they've never been different. But growing up in the U.S., every day you're reminded that the color of your skin is different. And it's not like, I don't like you because mm -hmm. you're, no, I'm talking about systemic history where you look at the most incarcerated people, they look like you. You look at the people who've been oppressed the most, they look like you. The mo so... After a while, man, it messes with you psychologically. That so when I came to Ghana, it was truly the first time in my life where I literally felt just like a human being. That's all. Let us go through that feeling. How was it like? What so so, so let, let, let me walk you when, when I got off the plane. Okay. This is at the old airport where you okay. have to get off the airplane and walk. catch the yeah, yeah. You walk, catch the thing. And when you enter into there's a the bigger quaba with mm -hmm. the lady with the fruit. That's the old airport. Mm -hmm. But when I got off the plane, it felt like, like, almost like some ancestors welcoming me. Mm. Seriously, I'm serious. And I tell this to people because it, it literally felt like, have you ever been to a place, when you go there, it's like, I've been here before, before. but you've I never been there. been there. That's how it felt. Wow. And then when I saw the people, um, I, I realized that most of what I was taught about the, the, the country and the continent was incorrect. What did they tell? Of course, you know, <laughs> this place, there's flies, there's no food, Bills blah, blah, blah. The stereotypical. The African. stereotypical African things, you know. And, and to be honest with mm. you, I didn't realize it, but I had this mentality subconsciously. I saw myself as like here, mm. and Africans were here. But right. I didn't know it until I got in relationship enough with some of my Ghanaian mm. or African brothers and sisters to have honest dialogue. Wow. And I saw how this unconscious kind of, you know, superior mentality was there. I didn't know it though, it wow. was there. Would you say you, you didn't want to associate yourself with Africa before knowing Africa? No, I actually did, but there was insecurity. Mm -hmm. Because keep in mind, the thing that really connects us is culture. Okay. In America, the thing that connects us, not all times, but sometimes is the color of our skin. So, when I would meet someone from, let's say, Africa, right? I mean, I, I knew nothing. So even if I tried to connect, they're like, this guy. Man. Yeah, there's nothing to read. That, that, this guy, like, he doesn't eat the food, doesn't listen to our music. He always was talking about this black stuff. Right. There's no connection. That is true. 
So, so there was an insecurity, and it was almost like Africa was like the way Muslims pilgrimage to Mecca. Africa was like, before I die, mm. I have to go to Africa. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Seriously. Interesting to hear that. Okay, so um, let me ask this. Did you know anyone? Or do you feel like, do you, do you know any family member long, long ago? When I first came? Yeah, before no. you. No. No one? No one. No. Yeah. So where were your forefathers from? America? <laughs> Man, listen, when you ask a black American that question, we don't know. Because literally the histories were so broken. Hmm. Because when, when you look at particularly, you know, black Americans, or let's say Africans in America, mm -hmm. they didn't arrive only with the transatlantic. Mm -hmm. However, a significant portion arrived with the transatlantic uh, slave trade. But they arrived as commercial property, the same way if you sold these chairs. You don't name these chairs. You mm -hmm. just say, I have two chairs. So when you had Africans that arrived in the Americas at that time, we didn't have names. It was, it was property. So keeping records, even for me, like I can go back, let's say to like the 1800s mm -hmm. for my family. But when you go back, I, we know that my grandfather, like the person who owned my family, but when you go back to a certain extent, there was no names, and so record keeping is extremely difficult to even trace that, you understand? I so understand. I don't know. Wow. I don't know. So you are here in Ghana now. Yeah, yeah. And you are saying Africa is the way to go. I, I really believe that. I think that if a person is coming from the diaspora, mm -hmm. the reason I believe, I personally believe that every person in the diaspora, if they've never been to Africa, you have to come here at least before you die. Hmm. You have to. Wow. Why do they have to wait before they die? Before at, at, least, at least before they die. You know, <laughs> if they do it sooner, great. But because when you look at historically, all of human civilization was birthed here. Hmm. When you look at even what we call mathematics, what we even call some of the, the written languages of the world, right? If you look at historically great civilizations, even like Timbuktu and how the world would go to Timbuktu to study and get research. When you look at great, amazing feats like, you know, the pyramids and, and, and um, you know, the, the, the Kush, right? The Kushites. Um, there's history of our African presence all over, but we don't even know it. That even for true. a lot of people who are religious, right? You read the Bible, you read about these Kushites, but you don't know these are these black folks in modern day Sudan. You know, yeah. that's who they are. Why, did, why was it so difficult that we couldn't, you know, kind of detect that it was us? I think because there's oftentimes not a lot of uh, correct teaching. Hmm. Most of the time, people are teaching, they don't know. They just read over it. There's, there's no connection. They don't have a map to say, okay, where is, when they read the scriptures, what is Cush? Where is that geographically? What do those people look like? Oh, it's not just some fairy tale place. It's an actual place. We're talking about modern day Sudan. And you see, you know, Sudanese, they're black. <laughs> they're really black. Mm -hmm. Right? I like the way you are very passionate about Africa and your mindset about Africa. But people living on the continent, most Africans don't think Africa is the yeah. way to go. They think US, yeah. I have to get a visa, go to America, go to yeah. UK before I can make it. What are you seeing that we or the people living here are not seeing? First and foremost, I'm empathetic because I understand. I mean, the truth is, Listen, let, I have to realize that I come from one of the most developed nations in the world. Yes. That's not a small thing. No. There are certain things I never worried about in my whole life. Electricity, mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. the basics. I never worried about those things, ever. Never. And so I'm definitely empathetic. And I also realized that someone told me this. They talked about, let's say, to be woke or to be conscious. They said it's even a privilege. Because in Ghana, you don't have time to be woke. Daddy, we need to eat. <laughs> you can't afford to be woke. <laughs> right? We have to eat. And, and I realized, you know what? It made me more empathetic because even, you know, in the U.S., the truth is being woke right now even is socially acceptable. And let's just say even reading. You can go to, we have public libraries. Mm -hmm. I know this is not a, a, a video to, <laughs> listen, this is making them even want to go to America. But what I see is this. What I see is that I see with foreigners' eyes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with a foreigner's mind. Mm -hmm. And I also see the future, right? I know what happens when you take a people, you strip away their culture, 
you strip away their identity. You tell them everything about themselves is negative, and that's that's how you have us, right? Black Americans who have a 1.2 trillion dollar spending power, but the black dollar circulates in the black community like less than one time, hmm. right? Hmm. When we spend all of this money on things like hair care products and and all of these superficial products, the Jordans, yes, Jordans. but it doesn't reinvest in our communities. Now we have a lot of people doing great things, mm -hmm. but by far and by large, I know what happens when you when you, let's say, you don't value your own culture, your identity so much, or have it taken away from you, and you're told a story that is not true, it's like I'm almost coming from the future to tell you, listen, you can have everything, but if you don't have identity, you don't have anything. Wow. Look in Ghana here, for example. Mm -hmm. How is it that other people can come mm -hmm. from different parts of the world and make start them. businesses, real estate, agriculture, you name it? But the same opportunities that is here in Ghana, the guy name is old child, there's nothing here. Let me go here. America, what glass and quine, all of this stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, <laughs> what is the core of this problem? Because it looks like we are going to school, yeah. learning, but not to kind of make it on the continent, but look elsewhere. Why do you think that is the problem? I think it's because of our mentality. You know, Kwame Nkrumah said that, right? I'm not born in, I'm not African because I was born in Africa, but I'm African because Africa was born in me. And I think that when you look at the education system and you even look at across the continent, when the colonial masters, let's say, freed Africa, we're talking about 1957. That's not a long time ago. No. 1960s, 1970s. That's not that's a, very recent. that's very recent. And you look at the curriculum that we have. What is the curriculum teaching us about ourselves and our identity? Exactly. No, it's teaching us to go to school, get a good job. Every year, 10 million people graduate uh, from university across the continent, but there's only 3 million jobs. Ha! Huh. Look no, at the numbers. Less than how many? 30%? Yeah. So even when you look at the numbers, it doesn't add up. But we have to be exposed, right, because of the, the, the work that people like yourself are doing to change the narrative. Um, and I think we have to just be honest about it. Wow. Interesting. Now, let me ask you this. A lot of people are moving back from the diaspora. Yeah. America, especially. Yeah, it's, it's true. crazy. It's, it's true. <laughs> and they are coming with, I'm coming home. Yes. And permanently, I'm not yes. going back. Why? What is happening in America? <laughs> so let me tell you, that was my mentality when I first came to Ghana. Mm. It's changed, dude. It is changed. <laughs> it's changed. <laughs> it's changed. <laughs> But when I first came, it was because imagine you are living in your parents' house right. every day. Your parents are, you have to, you, like, and you don't realize, like, you just feel like I have to get out of this place. Mm. And then you leave and you realize our life is hard. Sure. I have to pay my own bills mm -hmm. and everything. It's difficult. So you don't appreciate home until you leave. And I think that my perspective is a little different because some people, you know, listen, they want me to hate America and all this. And I don't. Because I really believe that God puts us in position, you know, not to be like, you know, like so biblical, mm -hmm. but kind of like Moses, where Moses was raised with mm -hmm. Pharaoh mm -hmm. for the specific purpose of knowing how to deal as a mediator between the Egyptians and, and the Israelites. So I think that for like someone like myself, I came from a place where the truth is for a black person, life is difficult. Mm -hmm. It's like to be poor and black in America. If you just make it out of this environment to just get a decent job taking care of your family, it's a miracle. Me hearing you say to be poor in America doesn't connect with me. I yeah. know America is the land of opportunities. Yeah. How can you be poor being in America? Yeah, and a lot of people ask that. And even they've told me, oh, I don't believe it. You are lying. I say, have you been there? No. So how can you tell me? But even where I lived, man, there's poor people everywhere. Yeah. It's poor people everywhere because it's just like in Ghana. You have some people who are poor, some people who are rich. So the truth is, it's all about identity and how we see it, right? When you're born in that environment, I think that you don't see the opportunities the same way as someone who comes from the outside. So like for myself, when I lived in Ghana, then I realized, hey, <laughs> hey there's some things about this place that be sweet. Um, so it's like, I realize, let's just take, for example, if I want to own a home. Right. I now realize that, okay, yes, in the U.S., with, let's say, even like $35,000 a year, which is not a lot of money mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's not. You are, you, are, you are practically poor. 
Oh, wow. No, serious. If you're making $35,000 a year. Is it equivalent to 35000 cities? No, 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 no. Like in kind of value? It, 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 it would be like, it would be like, let's say about 10,000 CDs. 10,000 CDs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's poor. Because That's when you remove taxes, okay. it's probably like 30,000. Okay. If you want to live in a decent neighborhood, the, the thing about Ghana and the U.S. that's different is sometimes if you're in a poor neighborhood in Ghana, you're still in a community where you don't worry about crime. Mm -hmm. You don't worry about someone breaking in your house. Mm -hmm. Someone mm -hmm. is going to steal your whatever. Right. The U.S., if you're in most cases, if you're in a poor neighborhood, you also have to worry about crime oh. and a lot of it. So if you are making this money and you want to live in a decent place, you know, you're talking at least maybe about eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month just for your rent. Wow. So ten percent of your income, or thirty percent of your income, if you're making thirty thousand, is going towards rent. You haven't paid utilities, food, all that stuff. Blah blah blah. Very interesting. Let me ask you this: When you decide, when exactly do you decide to move permanently? It was around two thousand and I think like um, sixteen, maybe. Sixteen. Because we had the string of horrible accidents with police and black Americans. Hmm. Uh, one of the incidents was uh, Mike Brown. So Mike Brown was a young kid. He was about 18 years old. He was unarmed. He was killed by the police in Ferguson, Missouri. This is what happened. So I'll tell you the story. Mm -hmm. I was coming to Ghana to plan for my next trip that I would bring people. Okay. So doing all the setup work. I marched with an organization called the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. So we were marching for like justice, right? From the place where the, the guy was killed to like the capital. And when we were marching, we were marching through a very small town. I don't want to give the name and embarrass the people who live in that town, but we were marching through a very small town, mostly white. And listen, the stuff we went through, people were shouting, people were throwing stuff at us. Uh, someone threw, or maybe they shot. Because of what? Because we were black marching through the town, you know, it's like, you know, get out of here, you stupid, blah, 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 a bunch of other stuff I can't say. Someone shot out uh, the bus we had, they shot one of the windows out. And it was terrible. It was horrible. And I'm thinking, we're just, we're literally just walking and they're like chanting, you know, we shall overcome all of these marches and stuff. And I felt so less than a human being, right, in my own home country. Fast forward to like two months, I came to Ghana. And I'm just like, wow, I'm a human being. And then when I had my child, I said, you know what? I, I want to have a place where I can raise children and, and they don't have to worry about being victimized simply because of the color of their skin. And it was that moment that I said, I told my wife, I said, I think the next place that we're supposed to be is Ghana. I don't know why. I just feel like that's the next place in life we're supposed to be. Wow. So you moved with your family? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I moved with my family. Immediate? No, no, no. So <laughs> we need money. Oh. <laughs> you know, in Ghana, it's not easy. Yes, so, yes, yes, so I took probably about two, two years planning. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I did a lot of planning. Okay. Um, everything like, the first question is, how will we get money? Like just all the details for planning because I have a family, so I had to plan more than let's say if I was a single person. So but, how did your friends and family really react to it? Oh, okay. So most people were like, we, we, we knew that you were going in this okay. direction because you've always most been that kind of, forward. you know, African guy, mm -hmm. pro-black, blah blah blah. So we knew this. Some people were just like curious, mm -hmm. you know, like oh why. You know, one guy, you know, all the stereotypes too, you know, are you going to have water? Are you going to have food? Um, in fact, people thought I was coming as a missionary. That's what they thought. Yeah. Because wow. in most cases, the only time you're coming to Africa is for philanthropy or missions. Mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> what is Ghana or Africa in the eyes of an American? How does it look like till 2022? Yeah. No, the old. The old. <laughs> For me, it's a place of refuge. It's a place of legacy. It's a place of heritage. It's a place of struggle. It's a place of opportunity. Um, it is a place to connect. Um, it's a place where it is a second home. It has challenges, mm -hmm. but it is a second home. And 
the opportunities outweigh the negative. And that's how I see it. Okay. Talking about negativity. Yeah. You've been in Ghana. Yes. You know how negativity yes. people can get. Yes. How are you managing your through that? Um, I think that, you know, as we were talking off camera, mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you have groups of people that have been traumatized and oppressed, they don't realize that they've been traumatized and oppressed. And I think that's the difference, too, about being a black American. Like, we know our history. Mm -hmm. We know what has happened to us. Right. So when we come to Ghana, it's shocking that people don't understand the impact of colonization and, like, certain areas back in the day, you know, like, let's say cantonments or something where only whites could go. And we just think, oh, that was just back then. But I think what happens is the impact is um, people have this, this idea where sometimes negativity is a little bit pervasive and it can bring you down. Um, but I also think I'm very empathetic because also, man, the system is hard. And I recognize it's very hard. Where the average person makes like, what, 1,000 CDs a month. That's even too much. That's even too much, right? 600, 700 CDs a month. And let's say you want to stay in a place where you have, that's decent. How much will you pay? Do you understand? 500 a month. 500 a month. And that's not month to month. Mm -hmm. That's 12 months, yeah. 24 months advance. So I recognize that it's difficult, man. It's it really difficult here. So on one hand, I understand why people are negative. And, uh, but on the other hand, you know, it's, 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 you just, for me, I had to hang around different people because I saw myself seeing Ghana the way they saw it. Mm. And then eventually it was like, oh, there's nothing in this place, so. So did you ever came to a point where you felt like, I should just carry my bag and go back? Every day, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no. <laughs> oh, I have sometimes those days, man. I have those days when, let's say, the light is off, the water is off. Someone has chopped my money for the last time that day. You know, and it's, uh, mm -hmm. hey, you want to do something very simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like, oh, master, I beg. I just want to do this thing and go. Mm -hmm. You have to do some encouragement fees. Yeah. It's too much. But I go back to this. And I'll be very honest. I think, mm -hmm. oh, I hope we don't get in trouble when I say <laughs> this. But See, I nice. think there are more negatives. Mm -hmm in Ghana than positives. Mm. But, so please don't edit this part, but <laughs> the positives are deeper than the negatives. For example, okay. the system is difficult. The structure is whatever. It's all about perspective. Remember, I'm coming from one of the most developed nations in the world. Right. Someone coming from, let's say, Nigeria or some other place. Charlie, Ghana is the place. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Mm -hmm. We even talk about lights off in Ghana versus Nigeria, mm -hmm. right? There's no comparison. Yeah. But the things that I find in Ghana that money cannot buy, things like peace. Mm. When my child goes out and he plays around, I'm not worried. Okay. When I walk around Ghana, I'm not worried. Wow. When I have an interaction with the police, I don't have any fear. Okay. Those are the things that money can't buy, and that's what I find. Oh, it's challenging, but those are the things that, that outweigh the other stuff. This is priceless. Yes. But how do you think you're adapting them? Because, like you said, you've been from you've been in an advanced society yeah. where infrastructure is over the roof, and yeah. it's almost like you are going back in yeah. time. Oh my God! How are you adapting? So, if I can be very honest with you, um, if if I don't go back to the U.S. every now and again, then I think I'll go crazy. Anyway. <laughs> but no, because really, no, seriously, that's just me. Other people may be different, mm. but here's why: because. This is what I tell people. Let's say, like, let's say there's a Ghanaian who lives abroad but then comes back to Ghana. Okay. The difference is the Ghanaian who lives abroad and comes back, he's coming back to memories. Maybe auntie, uncle, someone pounding fufu, you're, mm -hmm. you're chopping or like you're eating around. Like right. he's coming back to all of these memories he has developed because this is where his culture is, his legacy is. You come back and talk to people from your community. Like, right. Right. But for, for someone like myself, okay. I'm making new memories here. Yeah. When I go back to the States, I'm going back to old memories. Okay. I'm going back to friends okay. that I know. We grew up the same culture. Okay. And there's just a connection there. Okay. So I think that, and also coming back to Ghana sometimes feels like you're stepping back in time. And it's just the frustration is not the structural issues. The frustration is that when you realize that there's so much that we could do, so much opportunities that we could create. And 
I think culture is so big, like you just need to connect with people from your culture. Um, and, and that's really important. How do you think we can kind of merge this? I think it happens with education, with things that you're doing, like with this wonderful channel okay. and having these conversations, because a lot of times we don't know each other's stories, mm -hmm. right? We just believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, some people, let's say black Americans may believe Africa is heaven. There's no problems. I'm going to go and just, you know, drink coconut water <laughs> and just have a nice life. Mm -hmm. Some people believe if I go to America, there's just gold and I just go to the ATM machine, I'll take money, I don't have to have a job or just foolish things. Um, and I think both can be true, depending on how you create your reality. So we have to tell each other stories. We have to create opportunities to really have <clears throat> very difficult conversations. The ones where we're almost frustrated with each other. And I think the other thing is we have to build economic opportunities with each other. Because there's so much that we could offer. I think mm -hmm. that the cultural capital that the African can offer a foreigner coming in is priceless to know how to navigate here, how to talk to people. How do you deal with, let's say the elder is over this, you need to manage this. How do you talk to that person? Like you, you, we don't know these things. Mm -hmm. So we need those people to teach us these things. On the other end, let's say if there's a new way of doing things, there's resources and opportunities that we have that the world is doing. We could bring that side and I think we can collaborate with that cultural capital, with the actual capital that we have over here. And I think we could do some great things. So what would you say are the major challenges that was like <clears throat> nerve cracking to you? Major third major challenges you Man. really faced that really kind of really hit you hard. That's a great question. That you feel like you could want to change in the future. I feel like the major challenge is identity. Like, identity. Yeah, like when you look at, you ask yourself, why is it that some of us, when we have an opportunity mm -hmm. to make a change, whether we're in big positions of leadership or not, we'd rather go buy houses in other countries. Right. But we'll drive an SUV through a poor town that we are from. Yeah. And we have the money to do something different, but we, but we don't want to do it. Or... We'd rather be liked by, let's say, our European counterparts. Wear a nice suit just to show them, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not the stereotypical African that you thought I was. So let me now <clears throat> buy Gucci be like you and this. Know. And you spend all this money just to prove that I'm civilized. Meanwhile, um, this money, and I'm not saying, listen, please. No, say that. If, if you want to buy Gucci and Louis Vuitton and all that, oh, by all means, if you have it, buy it. But I'm saying that when we, when, when we sacrifice our own cultural identity in pursuit of this other one, that's what I'm speaking of. And this is the same mentality that will we'll say there's nothing in Ghana. We can't do anything here. But someone from the outside will say, oh, I see all these opportunities. It's because we don't instill in our children that we should love this place and not just instill it in words, but in deed, but providing the opportunities to be successful. Job creation, entrepreneurial support, grants for people who are doing things like media, music, television, film, because <clears throat> the world is actually looking at Africa. Mm. How? Let me tell you something, at least from the outside. When, when I tell someone about Ghana, Ghana, mm -hmm. people are like, wow. You've been to Ghana. You live in Ghana. Wow. Really? Man, I, I want to go to Ghana. Mm. When I wear my, sh I, I, when I wear like my, my, my regular Ghanaian shirts with the colorful print and people see that on the outside, mm -hmm. they're like, wow, I need that. So people see the value in us, but sometimes we don't see the value in ourselves. And as a result of that, this is what happens. <clears throat> This is why someone can come in and capitalize on our culture, monetize our culture, and then the same opportunities that we had, we don't do anything with it. Because mm -hmm. we, we don't know what we have sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. You, you said something about trying to, you know, be like the white man, showing status. <clears throat> you know, example, Gucci is probably $30,000, and a black guy living in any, a ghetto would probably buy a three ton Gucci, whatever. Meanwhile, he could probably buy four acres of land in Ghana yeah. and do farm. Let's speak on that and 
why that mind control is really a thing impeding growth in the black community over the world? Sometimes we don't know it's there. It's like it's exposure. Mm. You know, if all of your friends are stupid, you also will be stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless you change your friends. Mm -hmm. If all of your friends are poor, even if you're rich, you'll become poor. Mm -hmm. Because you'll start to think like them and act like them and do like they do. Unless you change your circle of influence. So I can speak specifically, let's say for the black community. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, it's like, let me tell you honestly. If you have certain clothes on and shoes that were not like name brand, Oh, you, 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 you'll get into fights every day. People will beat you up. Because you, you don't need Yes. To read in America? Yes. Why? Listen, if you go to... <laughs> we don't have the time, but listen, <laughs> let me tell you something. If you don't go to certain schools, like let's say you're part of certain schools, mm -hmm. and you have on, let's say, some shoes and clothes where it's not name brand, Nike, Reebok, something, something, something. You will get into fights every day. So the pressure, right? So you don't want to be the guy that's fighting every day. So you say, oh, let me, let me, let me get a job, right? Even though I'm making $100 a week, which is good money if you're like 15 years old or something, you will spend that $100 on some shoes because I want to be accepted. Wow. Unless, right, your parents take you in a different environment where people are like, so what? We don't care if you right. have these. But if you're in that environment, no, you're going to spend that $100 Let's on Let's talk shoes. about mental slavery <clears throat> and financial education yeah. in the black community. Um, I mean, I think it goes hand in hand. As I said, right, we have a $1.2 trillion spending power, which means that every year black people in America spend $1.2 trillion. That's a lot of money. On what? Okay, some of the things. I mean, a lot of different the majority things. majority of, of it. Um, I don't know specifically the majority, but I do know there are some great resources out there. I do know we spend a lot of money on hair care products, mm. clothes and shoes, things like that. A lot of us are doing great things in terms of business, real estate. There, there, there's actually a movement happening where people are really, 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 um, you know, having a financial revolution. One of my favorite podcasts is Earn Your Leisure, where uh, Troy and Rashad, I mean, these guys are creating a financial revolution to help us break from that mentality and think about instead of giving our kids $200 pair of Jordans, how can we give them a business? Okay. How can we give them stocks? So it's happening slowly but surely, especially with the power of media. But sometimes you just don't know, man. Mm. You, you, you know, it's like Ghana. Like if, if someone is watching right now and they want to kind of make a move, but they don't know how to <clears> adapt, <throat> what would you think would be the best advice for that person? To Ghana? Yeah. They, and they're coming from where? Just US. US. UK. Uh, the first, I think the first thing is start watching uh, YouTube channels like this. Mm -hmm. Collect all the information. The second thing is uh, take a trip. Just come. Come for 10 days, 15, whatever your job will allow. And just come check things out for yourself. That's okay. the first step. Just right now, listen, if you're watching this right now, you, you've been contemplating, maybe I'll go, I don't know. Mm -hmm. 2022, mm -hmm. December, come to Ghana. If I'm here, look me up. Yeah. So let's say, um, would you say you're comfortable living in that? Yes. You're comfortable. Very much so right now. Wait, wait, wait. How, what do you mean by comfortable? <laughs> Ghana economy is hard. So, so what do you mean by comfortable? So everything. Everything to get comfortable. Everything. Okay, some areas, yes. Like, elaborate on that. So when I come to Ghana, to be honest with you, my expectation has to come down. Mm -hmm about like what I expect about certain things. Um, yes. So when my expectation comes down, then yes, I'm comfortable. <laughs> no, are you, <laughs> are you comfortable? Listen, <clears throat> people moving permanently to, to, to Ghana and yeah, Africa. Yeah. We, we all want to build Africa. Yeah. Right. We want it to be like what we have out there. Yeah. Meaning we want it to be like yeah. US and yeah. everything. Yeah. So if you don't, I don't, I don't know how to put it. You must be very uncomfortable in order to create a comfortable. I get you. you know I get you. I get you. Um. So then in that case, I say maybe I'm, 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 I'm yet to be comfortable. Mm. I'll say that. Mm. To be honest, what I realized was I didn't have enough money. Because Ghana is actually expensive. Hmm. Really? How expensive? Because 
a lot of people who are watching most likely are going to live in Accra, right? Mm -hmm. Accra is one of the most expensive cities in all of Africa. Yeah. Most people are not going to live in a self-contained, which is, you know, what some people will call a, um, um, a studio, right? And even when you think of a studio apartment, you're probably thinking of a studio apartment that's nice. You know, mm -hmm. lights, water, it's clean, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. A 300 CD self-contained <laughs> in a crowd, mm -hmm. what will it get you, right? So the, the truth is, the average diaspora, and let's say if they come, they're going to probably stay, or they may choose to stay in a, a developed area or a gated community. And unfortunately, the necessity sometimes in Ghana become a luxury. The necessity such as just like a clean environment, man, where you go out, you don't have to worry about, you know, rubbish everywhere. Your kids can walk around. Just the basics, water, electricity. These are the basics. But in Ghana, unfortunately, these things become luxuries. So those who have more access to stable electricity, stable water, paved roads, those places are typically more expensive. So there may be what, if let's say if you have a family, you may pay in some places in a crop maybe two, three thousand dollars a month for rent. And that's twelve months up front. So that's maybe like thirty six thousand dollars. Wow. Just for rent. Wow. So that is very interesting. What are you currently doing on a concert business wise? So currently I do consultation. Mm -hmm. Folks who want to come to Ghana. Oh, okay. um, I want them to do it the right way. And I've spent a lot of money, a lot of time. I've wasted a lot of money, a lot of time. And I realized that, unfortunately, so many people from the diaspora don't plan well enough. And they get excited because they come for holiday. Mm -hmm. The holiday Ghana is different from the, the permanent Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so they come here, and the number one thing I see is they don't have enough money to survive here. So for me, what I want to help them do is do it the right way. So I consult them. Also through workshops and trainings on um, everything from, you know, uh, building cultural competency to communications. Mm -hmm. I'm also recently released a book um, entitled Akwaba, The Complete Guide to Your Stay in Ghana. Okay. If you're visiting or if you're living in Ghana, um, I put a bunch of great information in there. One of the resources I'm really excited about is I have a resource called 50 Questions um, If You're Finding a Home in Ghana. And it's things that if you're coming from the outside, you don't know to ask, okay. like, where does the water come from? Okay. Do you have backup electricity? What does it have the power to actually wow. back up? How do you dispose of your trash? Wow. Is there a church or a pub nearby? Because that's very important to assess the noise levels. Yeah. These things you don't have to think about, but I want to I put all that information in the book because I learned all these lessons the hard wow. way. And it's already out? Oh, it's already out. They can okay. download it from the website. Um, as soon as you download it, phew, it's there in your inbox. So share those informations with the people watching right now. Yeah, sure, sure. The website is simply timswain.com. That's T-I-M-S-W-A-I-N. I believe maybe there'll be some links below mm -hmm. uh, dot com. If you go to the website or if you just go to Google, type in Tim Swain, Ghana, mm -hmm. everything else will pull up. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you a very interesting question. No problem. If your American citizenship passport is taken from you, right? Would you say you would be able to live in Ghana? That's a great question. So that means that I'm no longer an American citizen. No. You're wow. A Ghanaian, and you you can't have dual citizenship. That's a. I've never been asked that question. That's a great really? question. Hey, I have to think about that. Oh, then I w I won't have a choice but to manage. <laughs> because why I ask that is the um the Ghanaians living here see diaspora coming in mm -hmm. and preaching how amazing ghana is and everything it frustrates them sometimes. yes yes it's true and they often say because you have a lot of you know opportunities and everything you don't see it yeah. we don't have that here and it makes it look like they don't know what they're doing and they yeah are but then because you guys have more it's true you know that's why i asked you that that question but Wouldn't you know easy but the same thing happens when africans go to the u.s mm, how? because africans come and I'm generalizing, so I apologize. But sometimes Africans come and there's a disconnect because they say, I've come from Africa, blah, blah, blah. You black Americans, you don't know the struggle. How can you be here this whole time? You don't have a business. You're not going to school. You're on the streets. You're doing this, you're doing that. You're doing drugs. But look at me. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I came from Africa. Mm -hmm. I've been here for six years. Mm -hmm. I'm a doctor, blah, 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 right? So because, and that's why we need to know each other's stories, right? Because sometimes the African will come and look down on the African American mm -hmm. because they think that these people are wasting opportunities, right. but they don't know the history. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know that actually you wouldn't be a doctor or a lawyer or be successful in America if it wasn't for black Americans mm -hmm. that fought, that bled, that died to open up the doors mm -hmm. for people like you. So we never should get so arrogant, whether you're American, Nigerian, Japanese, whatever you are, to believe that you know better. Mm -hmm. I can understand the Ghanaian frustration, mm -hmm. um, and that's why I said I'm empathetic. So if a Ghanaian tells me I want to leave this place, then I say I can understand why. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is, for me, now don't get it twisted. Just because I'm American doesn't mean I, I don't have to work hard. Mm -hmm. Listen, I tell people, listen, I have three degrees. <laughs> I pay for three degrees, mm -hmm. so I work hard. But the truth is, there, there are different opportunities. So I don't preach to people, you have to stay here and this. And listen, if you want to leave, by all means, leave. But I will tell you this, I don't care where you go in the world. If you are a person that doesn't have discipline, you don't have the mentality to be successful, if you're unsuccessful in Ghana, you'll be unsuccessful anywhere in the world. It's true. Yeah. Because if you go to America and you don't know anyone, and the biggest difference is now you're not Ghanaian or Ewe or Ashanti or Asante. You'll be black. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then your accent, uh, people don't understand you. And then you're probably really black. Hey. <laughs> it, 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 it'll be difficult. You said something about the African looking down on the black woman. Yeah. But I, I, had, I, heard, I had someone on my show and she said she was bullied <clears throat> by black Americans. It happens all the time. It's, it's because of identity, man. Like... I'm going to tell you right now, if you go as a, let's say, typically black, mm. like African, like black, and you go to school, the people sometimes that will treat you the worst are black Americans. Wow. It's because we're taught to hate ourselves, man. Mm. So when we see somebody that's black and African, remember all of those subconscious ideas about Africa are coming back, you know, dirty African, African booty scratcher. All the, I don't even know what an African booty you scratcher see some is. Scratchers when you came here. I mean, hey, I saw <laughs> I saw people scratching a, a bunch of things, but I understand because I understand the history. But I can imagine that it's traumatizing for that African coming in because for the first time they are now black, and they see somebody else black, and they're thinking, "You're like me," and the person, "Oh, you dirty African," and so I empathize. I understand though that it's the it's the trauma man that it's just like it's just like when the African American comes to Ghana and they say my brother and they say, Oh yeah, you my brother, but Charlie, this is the O'Bruni price. So <laughs> yeah. So and you feel like, but I'm your brother. Yeah, yeah you're my brother, but yeah, yeah. yeah, this won't be fifty Ghana CDs. <laughs> you feel well, violated, like wow. I see a lot of people complaining about that. Yeah. Do you think there's a solution for that? Oh. Yeah, the solution is just know you're in Africa. Mm. And, and you have to understand, for me, I've, I've bec like I said, I've become more empathetic. So now, well, first and foremost, certain places I don't even go to. Where? Oh, I won't mention where, but like, let's say if I want to buy certain things, because I know like, I don't want to haggle okay. and this and this and this. I mean, I know how to do it now. It's different now. But I think that the difference is, it's about expectation. Okay. Some people come... And they have a false expectation like, oh, you're my brother, you shouldn't cheat me. But they don't understand that sometimes, you know, the person who was selling them this, whatever. Mm -hmm. Listen, if they don't sell this one thing today, they mm -hmm. may not eat. eat yeah. and, and, and also, don't take it personal. Mm -hmm. Because if you're Ghanaian, Nigerian, Kenyan, Asian, Charlie, everyone gets their money chopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Sure. So don't take it personal. It's not an American thing. You can be anyone. In Ghana, your, your money will be chopped. Well, now, I, I give this as a gift for people watching, the entrepreneurs. People want to move back. They want to do some kind of business here. You've been here long enough, over 15 years back and forth. You've done a lot of visibility strikes, I think. What would you say would be an ideal investment? If real real estate. To, real estate. But that's just me. Um, it depends on what your passion is. Some people are not passionate about real estate. They're passionate about barbering they're passionate about agriculture it depends on what so i can't tell you mm -hmm. because i'm gonna tell you something 
especially in Ghana. Ghana will test your passion. And if you're not really passionate about what you're doing and you're just trying to make some money, Charlie, Ghana will <laughs> Ghana will frustrate you. Now advise the youth of Africa. Those are really you've said you are you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Advise them. We have to read. You have to read about our, you know, our leaders, man, the, the forefathers who came before us. You have to read books by Kwame Nkrumah, Why Africa Must Unite. You have to read books by Walter Rodney, um, you know, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. You have to read the works of even black revolutionaries around the world. You have to read African leaders, um, uh, Sankara. Um, uh, you have to read because what you see is you get perspective about the struggle that people have gone through and you also get perspective about what they saw of Africa and it really just ignites your imagination. And I think that the other thing is you have to really have a vision about what you want to do because the opportunity is there. You write your vision, you put it in your heart and you don't let anybody deter you from that. So. What do you have to say about, you know, the African leaders who have been assassinated? Those who... Oh, who've been assassinated. Okay. Yeah. okay. I thought you said the current African leaders. Oh, no. Because if anyone, whoever <coughs> rises in Africa to kind of make the, its citizens and its people comfortable, always end up being assassinated. Yeah, yeah. One way or it's other. true, Why but you know, it's not just an African problem. I mean, just even like recently, um, uh, the prime minister in, um, is it Japan? Japan. Yeah, was just assassinated. Public, yeah. Yeah, in public. Mm -hmm. So the truth is, People believe that if I stand up for what I believe in, I'll be assassinated. No, it's not true. In most cases, no one is worried about you because you're not making any impact at all anyway. But I think that what we have to understand is these people believe in something greater than themselves. And they died for us. They literally died for mm -hmm. us. If you want to go on a tangent, this is kind of the essence of Christianity. He said, mm -hmm. you know, greater love has no man than this to he'll lay down his life for his friends. Mm -hmm. so all the pastors and stuff watching, <laughs> listen, this is the essence of it. Well, people literally died for a future that they could not see. And I think that we owe it to them to be our best selves, whether it's an engineer, whether it's a plumber, agriculture, whatever it is, we owe it to them to be our best selves so that we can make them proud. That's our responsibility. Wow. Now, let me ask you, there are diasporans who have moved back to the continent. They couldn't make it. They yeah. got frustrated. Mm -hmm. They left. Mm -hmm. They couldn't adapt. Mm -hmm. What would you say would be their advice for them if they want to move back? What should they do? You've said something even yeah. similar, but I would say take your time. It's not a failure mm -hmm. that you couldn't. I'm gonna say you couldn't. Maybe you realize this is not the place for you. And I had many conversations with people like that. Take your time. Maybe Ghana is not a permanent home. Maybe Ghana is a vacation. Okay. You can still take advantage. Maybe buy a vacation home in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Come and visit for three months, two weeks. You don't have to live here to take advantage of the opportunities that are here. Okay. You know? Interesting. Now, let me ask you my last question before we go. You've moved back. Do you think it's worth it? Absolutely. No doubt. Absolutely. Really? One of the absolute best decisions, by the grace of God, I've been able to make. Wow. Absolutely. No doubt. 100%. So they should also move back. If, if, <laughs> if, 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 if you can. Okay. But definitely you have to come. And if moving back is in your future, then do it. For me, Africa, not just Ghana, actually. My vision really is to be in other countries. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. Af Ghana is just the first country. Ghana is just the first one. But my vision really is to, my, my vision is to expose my children and other individuals to the beauty of the diaspora. Because every place has its own character and integrity. And I think that exposes us. So. Beauty of the diaspora. Yeah, the beauty of the, the whole African diaspora, you know, on the continent and even in other places like Brazil, Jamaica, all these other places okay. in the African diaspora. Okay. Um, but Ghana's just a place to, um, that's the entry gate. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's very interesting. Nice conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, what would be your last words? If you have any words of advice or anything you have to say, what would it be? My last advice would be, as I mispronounced this, but Brafier, come home. <laughs> Come. That's it. Come. Wow. Yeah, so that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for speaking to me. I yeah. really appreciate it. I hope all, you know, your answers, your questions has been answered.
on this interview. If it's your first time, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. He is also a YouTuber. I will leave his uh, YouTube channel link in the description and also on the screen. Go and show some love. And he actually makes videos on how to, you know, I saw some videos, yeah. strategies on how to, you know, get house and everything. So head to his YouTube channel and yeah, subscribe and watch some amazing videos there. So yeah, this is the end of the video. And yeah, peace out.